Yours, pray, give thanks. I want to preach from this subject, standing orders for the church. Standing orders for the church. Father, bless us now in Jesus' name as we preach the word of the Lord. We pray, O oh God, that you bless us to Walk in, live, and exhibit the standing order for the church. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse 16, rejoice. Verse 17, pray. In verse 18, we find give thanks. I'm taking my subject from these words, these phrases from these three passages of scripture. These three verses have been called by some the standing orders of the church. They are imperatives. They are forceful. Forceful and they are commands. And they direct the attitudes and the actions of the church. These three are to direct the attitude and the actions of the church as in the body of Christ, the church uh, as in the local assembly, and then the church as with every individual believer. All right? The orders of the church, the imperatives, you could call them, of the church, or the commands of the church. Now, like this, the triplets for personal development. The fact is that these are imperatives. As imperatives, these are crucial. What I've just read to you is of vital importance. And uh, they, they, these are essentials. Praise the Lord. And also, they are urgent. God is saying something to, it, to us today. Upper room to those who are streaming into the body of Christ. If we want to go on in perpetuity or at least continue until Jesus comes, uh, even as a, a local church, you know, I pray that the Lord allows me to live for a long time. But also pray that this ministry outlasts me. Praise the Lord. I don't want to lead in such a manner that I drive it into the ground. And I don't want to leave it in such a condition that it cannot continue. Praise the Lord. I cannot say that when the baton was passed to me, that my predecessor, my spiritual father, did not give me a firm foundation and something to work with because he did. And the instructions that Paul gave to Apollos were the instructions that God gave to me. No foundation can any man lay than that which is laid, and that is Christ Jesus. He says, but let a man be careful how he builds on another man's foundations. I hold that even 32 years later, much of the success of the upper room 
is directly tied to the vision of the founder of the church. Throughout the history of this church, it has only had two pastors. I'm, sir, I, I'm honored to serve as the second leader of this ministry. And God has blessed us to accomplish some good things. But I've been driving and riding on a road that someone else paved. The goal is to set the saints up. To set the church up. That no matter what happens in this world. Until Jesus comes. We're able to be a church. We're able to thrive. We're able to be impactful. There are some essentials. There are some things that are crucial for the survival of the church. Someone said, well, Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That will always be a church. And that is true, but with that being said, there are things that has to be done to assure that there will always be a church. We're born in a country that when we were born in it, we were born into freedom. We were born in a, uh, a republic. Amen. A republic. America is a, repub a democratic republic. Somebody said, we have, we, we, this is a democracy. It's not a democracy. It's a republic, which has democracy in it. Amen. And, and what, it has, what it assures us uh, is freedom. Praise the Lord. And, um, uh, and, and, and there's been a lot of things that have been wrong with the country. And the country has addressed many of its past ears. Somebody, you might say, well, there's some things wrong with the country today. Well, there's going to always be something wrong with anything that men and human beings are a part of. But we were born in a country where there is an abundance of opportunity, especially uh, today. Amen. Most poverty in our country today and lack of opportunity is tied to behavior. Amen. People who do right, act right, and play by the rules in this country, regardless of color, can get ahead. Amen. Well, you may, well, I can't get as far ahead as this person. That may be true. But then there's someone who can't get as far as you've got. All of us. Or ahead of someone and behind somebody else. Amen. Amen. So, so it's so it's it's, it's even. It's it's a wash, and and, uh, and 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 you don't want to do anything, young people. You don't want to make a move, to or moves to disqualify yourself, to stymie your own growth. We've just watched in the news where a multimillionaire who's uh, a football player who stood to make millions more just seemed to be determined to sabotage his own future. And then when he makes these moves, he blames everyone else. It's everybody's fault but his. Amen. If you decide to go to school and be a clown and not learn, amen, or if you decide that you want to be a thug for a while, you're going to be a thug for a minute and get a record. You decide that you're going to do these things to yourself. 20 and 30 years later, those things can still be hindering you. And you may argue that that's not fair. Fair or not, that's the way that it is. But God didn't do it. Society didn't do it. You did it. There are certain things that has to be done to assure a certain outcome. Are you with me? I want to talk to you about today are some things that are crucial. 
Amen. Simply put, these three are a must. If a church is to survive, if a church is to thrive, if a church is going to be impactful, then that church must rejoice, pray, and give thanks. Allow me to take it a step further. Let me personalize it. If a believer is to thrive, if a believer is to survive, if a believer is to be impactful, then that individual believer must rejoice, pray, and give thanks. Are you with me today? Let's talk about the contextual setting of our text after preaching out the church at Thessalonica. And Thessalonica was an important, crucial, uh, important, an important commercial and military center, a port city in ancient Macedonia, part of the ancient route on the Egyptian way. Paul preached out a church there, but he had to leave the city before he wanted to leave. Acts chapter 17 verse 1 says, Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. They're in Macedonia. All right? And Paul, and in the city of Thessalonica, and, and Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days, for three weeks, reasoned with them out of the scriptures. He started with the Jews, opening and alleging, here's what he claimed, that Christ must needs to have suffered. He preached the cross. And again, need to have suffered, raised again from the dead, risen from the dead, excuse me, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. That he went to the Jews and he preached to them that this Jesus, whom they crucified a few years ago, <clears throat> he was indeed the Christos. Of God. He was the Messiah. He was the one that Moses said would come. The people to whom he preached did not uh, deny that Jesus lived, but they believed that he was Jesus of Nazareth, Mary's illegitimate son, and that he was a prophet at best, but that he was not the Christ. Paul argued for three Sabbath days, that not only was Jesus Mary's baby, and not only was Jesus from Nazareth, but Jesus was indeed the Christ, and not only did they crucify him, but that he is alive, and he has sent me to you. And after three weeks of debating and talking to Jews who were rooted in Judaism but had not accepted Christianity, the Bible says that Paul had a tremendous measure of success. It says, and some of them believed and consorted, that is, they cast their lot with Paul and Silas. And of the devout Greeks, a great multitude and of chief women not a few. Many of the upper class women got saved. Many of the Greeks, that is the Hellenized Jews, and even Gentiles gave their hearts to the Lord. So Paul won a huge uh, group of people. And, and I like the way Luke says it, of chief women, upper class women, not a few. And uh, it says, but the Jews which believed not. There's always somebody who is not going to believe. Moved with envy, 
took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort. They went out and got depraved individuals, wicked folk. Uh, they became a diverse group. Religious people who got other wicked people who practice all kind of pagan, ungodly behavior. And it says this, men of the baser sort. These were idle men. These were human beings uh, just out to do. They, they, had, they had no purpose, no goal. They just stood around. They were not winners. They were not like the upper class of women and the, the devout Greeks and the, those that Paul won. So the devil got his army of people who were wicked. And, and, uh, and notice this. And set all the city on an uproar. Notice, you see that now in society. When, when people don't believe in, 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 if you have a difference of opinion, they boycott your, your, your business. They will attack you. They will go outside your home and uh, uh, cause a disturbance. All kinds of things. All in the streets. They shut down the businesses and everything. So you thought that these Antifa tactics were new. They were, they were all, they've been in the Bible for a long time. And so now when you have a difference of opinion, you're almost afraid, unless you have the Holy Ghost, to say what you believe. Because people will try to shame you or get your name and your address and post it online so that other kooks can come to your house and try to call to, and try to frighten you. These tactics aren't new. These are ancient satanic pagan tactics so what they did because they couldn't win in the arena of ideas then they tried to employ intimidation that's the way they're doing now if a person can't uh, can't uh beat you in the exchange of ideas and they're not even willing to just agree to disagree they try to intimidate you into not believing what you believe you know, I was telling you about the media and Cam and how they said nothing about him having on a scarf. I know what would make him, would make him talk. Let him put a MAGA hat on. Let him go do an interview with Make America Great Again. Put, put that red hat on, Cam. I bet they'll have something to say about how you look then. It's amazing what we tolerate and then what we scoff at. Oh, this world is messed up. And so they got these people, and they put the whole city in an uproar. And look at what they did. They stoned, they assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. They went to Jason's house, and they attacked the house of Jason, trying to get Paul and Silas. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city. They pulled them out and brought them before the civil authorities, crying, these that have turned the world upside down are come here also. Whom Jason hath received. Said Jason took him in. And, and these all do contrary to the decrees of, of Caesar. Now what's amazing is those Jews couldn't stand Caesar. The Jews in the synagogue hated Caesar. And now because it's convenient for them, they all of a sudden now love Caesar. And they accuse Paul of doing things contrary to Caesar. And here's what they did that was contrary to Caesar. Saying there is another king, one Jesus. I had my daughter to tell the story. I was honored when I learned that a Muslim family who wanted to put their children in our preschool, you know, we got five stars, top notch. Amen. You can't get any better than that. Praise the Lord. Let me bring that up. So I don't want you to think that we got a rag over there, mom and pop shop. The best. Five stars. Can I get a witness? And they wanted to bring their child. And uh, 
And the dad, uh, uh, they, they explained to them that we're a Christian school. But here's our curriculum, and, and we're going to teach your child, but now we have Christian values. And the father went online and pulled up my preaching. And then called back and said, we will not put our child in your school because your preacher preached that there's only one God and that Jesus is his name. Praise the Lord. And so since he only believes that Jesus is the Lord, then we know that they're going to try to put that in our child. So we will not take him. What a compliment. Praise the Lord. See, you know why he was so uh, uh, taken? Muslims in this country are accustomed to Christians being wish-washy. They're not. But they're accustomed to Christians. Because uh, most Christians do. Lay, they, most Christians lay aside their Christianity in the name of diversity. There's a word for that. It's called idolatry. It's called being a traitor to God. They're used to Christians uh, toning down their Christianity, not bringing Jesus up so as not to offend anyone else. But we don't want to be offensive. But what about our being offended? Praise the Lord. What about God being offended? Praise the Lord. So uh, I'm glad that they, they moved on. And I'm glad that the school said, well, okay, thank you. Because somebody would have got fired had they said, no, 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 no. We promise you there will be no talk of Jesus. Come on to our Christian preacher. It's a Christian preacher. But we, we're not going to talk about the Lord. We don't do that stuff here. When we bring up religion, we just say we're part of the faith community. I'm not in the faith community. I'm in the Christian faith community. The faith community. That doesn't describe us. I'm just so glad to be a part of the faith community. What, what? What faith? Which one? Politicians, God bless America. Who's God? Which God? What God? Since there's over 2,000 gods represented now in this country, you ought to bring up the one you're talking about. If you're real, you'll bring him up. And that, it ain't nothing, it ain't nothing but the spirit of Antichrist. Jesus said, that warned us that there would come a spirit of Antichrist in the last day. He never warned that there would be a spirit of anti-God, but anti-Christ. So you see these politicians, they'll talk about God. You think that they're doing something. And we just want to say to you, God bless you. Which God? Well, it's not good politics to, to, uh, 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 to, to uh, name the one you serve. Uh, Muslims give praise to Allah in a heartbeat. When, when Tyson got out of prison, I, wanted, I praise Allah. Allah is the only God. Knocking everybody out talking about Allah. Then Buster Douglas knocked him out. Muhammad Ali Cassius Clay changed his name. Changed his name. Changed his religion. And, 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 and boxed in the name of Allah because the black Muslims wanted him to recognize his God. Why Christian athletes aren't as dedicated? They said, let me get to this. Uh, you all don't like it, but I, I got you thinking. Because, see, they're accustomed to us being wish-washy. Oh, oh, she's a Christian. Okay, well, come on, come on. We're going to the party uh, in our uh, 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 business. We're, we're having a corporate party. He, he's a Christian. Here, here's the liquor. Because he's a Christian. He'll drink with us. Praise the Lord. Here, he's, he, she's a, oh, that movie star, that actress is a Christian. Yeah, oh, they're born again. Look at them. As they take off their shirt, the top, let the breast hang out. Show that behind. Look, oh, she's a Christian, but she's playing a role where she cussed like a sailor. That, see, that, that's the new image of Christianity. A, a, a Christian rapper. You got, uh, uh, what's that guy's name? Kanye. All down in Atlanta. All at the church. 
And then you get clowns on Facebook. You don't know. He could be a modern day Paul. God could be using. The devil is a liar. The devil is a liar. The Lord told us to come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord. Wish wash your Christian. A lot of us are just reeds shaking in the wind, in the wind. And that's why a lot of Christians have trouble with me. They say, wooden is too hard. No, 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 no. I am a regular, everyday, run of the mill. Christian preacher who preached Christianity the way Christianity used to be preached before before the smooths got the best of us and, and before we decided that the praise of men is more important than the praise of God there was a time when everybody preached like I preach my pastor preached this stuff every Sunday First one I ever heard say, come out from among them. Be ye separate. First man I ever heard say, holiness is right. First time I heard somebody talk about what it meant to be sanctified. And then demonstrated it. So it was commonplace, mother. It was commonplace. Now you're hard. Now it's something different. Now you're almost an enigma. Now you almost got to, some of you feel like you got to explain to people why you're still here. Yeah, I still go to the upper room. Hey, if you're ashamed of us, baby, go on somewhere else. Because we're not, we're not changing. We're not changing. We're not going to change. Not change. Yeah. Are you still over there? Yes! Yes! Maybe you left and went to the candy church where y'all play, where the preacher won't stand for anything. They call the thin preachers. But all the Lord has called me to do is preach about relationships. Show me that in the Bible. Show me in the Bible where the Lord called the preacher to spend all the time preaching about relationships on. No, no, no. We're in the last days, y'all. And uh, so let me get back to this. Let me get back to it. So now says that, 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 that there's another king, this one Jesus. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they had heard these things. And when they, look at this, and when they had taken security of Jason and of the others, they let them go. Here's what Jason did. Jason, the fire was hot. Jason said, I will put up my house, my property, and all that I own. And I'll promise you that these, this was a low place, that they will leave. If you don't, if you don't kill them, I, I'll, I'll risk everything that I have. I'll put it all on the line. If you just don't kill them, I'll risk everything. Let them go. And with, with Jason cosigning, amen, Paul, the Bible says in verse 10, and the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night. And they went to Berea. And when they went to Berea, they started the same thing. With the Bereans, started preaching. Uh, but see, the Bereans, verse 11 teaches, were more noble than those of Thessalonica. For the Bereans are the ones I'm trying to get you to be like. In that they received the word of God with readiness of mind. Amen. That is with simplicity. The members of, of the Berea were teachable. Pastor, I just have a problem with what you're saying. You know, the Berean, the Bereans were, Bereans were teachable. You got to decide whether you're going to be a Berean or a Thessalonican. With readiness of mind, and look at what the Bereans did, and search the scriptures daily. Daily means every day, y'all. Search the scriptures daily whether those things were so. So he had to leave there before he wanted to. It was a sad day. He had to leave. Are you with me? Uh, but Paul felt in his heart that he had not had enough time to ground the saints at Thessalonica in the Christian doctrine and desired to return to Thessalonica 
but he could not do so because according to his own words, even though he wanted to go back, the Bible teaches, according to Paul's own words, that Satan hindered him. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17 and 18 says, But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time, in presence, not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face, and greatly with great desire. He says, even though we had to leave you presently, you never left our heart. And we wanted to see you with great desire. Wherefore, we would have come unto you. Even I, Paul, I would have come to you once and again. I would have returned to you over and over. But Satan hindered us. The devil blocked it. But Paul not being one to be defeated. Paul said, if I can't get there, I'll send somebody. Thank God for good workers. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, Paul says, Wherefore we could no longer, for wherefore when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone. We stayed at Athens and sent Timothy our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborers, laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. So Paul says, even though I couldn't come, I sent Timothy and Timothy went there and he took up the work that I left off because Paul understood that without being rooted, listen to this, in the Christian doctrine, the people would not be able to make it. So he sends Timothy back in. Timothy goes there and ministers, and according to verse 6, Timothy br brings back a good report. The Bible says, but now, uh, verse uh, 6 of chapter 3, but now when Timothy came from you unto us, and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, and that ye have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us as we also to see you. He says, Timothy told me that you hadn't forgotten what I told you. And Timothy talked about your faith and your love one for another. But he also brought back some concerns. Timothy told him that there were some moral and ethical concerns about the things that were going on in Thessalonica. So Paul writes and says in chapter 4 verse 3, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you abstain from fornication. See, pagan moral corruption, amen, uh, looked on fornication either as uh, indifferent or favorably. The pagan gods, in many ways, fornication, sexual immorality, was a part of their worship. It was a part of their service. Amen. This is why we have to always be careful that we keep our church music, our church dress, even our worship, even the way we shout. Make sure things don't become too sensuous. Because there's, all, there's always been a, a mixture of sensuality with pagan worship. And the devil will always try to get in and try to make the church too sexy. See, the preacher is not supposed to try to be a sex symbol. Amen. That's why the preacher, or not the preaching, ripped jeans and, praise the Lord, uh, trying to look like a rock star. No, 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 you're not trying to have sex appeal. You're trying to te teach people the word of God. So this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you abstain from fornication. That every one of you, now please listen to this, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and, and honor. He says that every born-again believer at the church at Thessalonica should learn how 
to possess his vessel. That is to control his body, to control his sex organs, to control his sexual behavior, and to do it with sanctification and honor. In times past in the holiness church, a big amen would have gone there. I got, a, I got O me at that time. Uh, and he says, as believers, I know that the society is filled with immorality through these pagan gods. He says, but as saints, not in the lust of concupiscence. That is, what is concupiscence? Impulse. You can't go with every thought that comes to mind. You can't have an idea and just go with it. You have to challenge your thinking. The devil says, do this, do that. Get with this one. Get with that one. Vicky, I was supposed to make my announcement. I'm going to do it at the end of the service. Get with this one. Get with that. Do this and do that. Praise the Lord. That's, 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 that is, uh, praise the Lord, evil the lust of concupiscence, the lust of impulse, even as the Gentiles which knew not God. That is doing whatever comes to mind with, with whoever. Do whatever with whomever. Whoever is willing. If you can't be with the one you love, love the one you're with. That's the devil. Saints can't live like that. Praise the Lord. Look at me throw cold, cold water on the surface. Saints can't live like that. Saints have to think. The believer is supposed to reason. The, re the believer is supposed to count up the cause. The believer has to grow to the point where I say, Lord, I can't be that impulsive because these impulses come from my flesh. Praise the Lord. And when I tell you what flesh does, flesh destroys you. When lust is conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, it bringeth forth death. Death of career, death of family, death of children. You destroy your son, you destroy your daughter, you destroy your marriage, you destroy your upward mobility, you destroy your name, you destroy all these things on impulse. Paul said, I'm, I'm going to preach in just a minute. Paul said to the saints at uh, Thessalonica, this is not what we do. He said, that's what the Gentiles did. That's what the Gentiles do. That no man, and he began to use some strong language here, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother. The word brother here is Christian brother. The word beyond means to cross boundaries that he should not have. He uses the word defraud. Defraud. And he's using fornication as a form of theft. When you get with your Christian brother or your Christian sister's uh, husband or wife, or you get with someone that you're not married to, you are taking something that is not rightfully yours. It is a form of defrauding. Paul says, notice what he says, look at the Bible, says that no man, what is good preaching in it, go beyond and defraud his brother in any matters. Praise the Lord. Because, here's why you shouldn't do it, because the Lord is the avenger mm, of all such. As we also have forewarned you and testified, says if you do it, if you better get out, you better come out, because God himself is the avenger. Do you see that? And then it says not the other reason why you shouldn't do it. For God have not called us to uncleanness, but unto holiness. So when you read, you will see that there were some concerns. There were eschatological uh, misconceptions that they had. They were concerned about what happens to believers when they die. And if you read uh, chapter 4, beginning with verse 13, he says, but, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, Concerning them which are asleep, uh, that you sorrow not. So Smith, uh, Brother Quentin, praise the Lord. So to Cassandra, that you sorrow not, God Almighty, as those 
uh, them that have no hope. Praise the Lord that you sorrow not. For if we believe that Jesus, praise the Lord, died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this I say unto you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Good God Almighty. For the Lord himself. Brother Randall, you lost your grandmother. For the Lord himself. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ. Don't worry about them. The dead in Christ, my God, you worrying about them. They shall rise first. She gonna, gonna beat you running. Praise the Lord. They, they're gonna get there. They're gonna rise first. And then I heard him say, and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. God Almighty, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Then I heard him say, comfort ye one another with these words. Tell him, don't, don't, don't. He, he's not saying don't cry over the people that you've lost. That's not what he's saying. He said, but don't cry like you don't know this. See, see the saint don't grieve like the sinner. We shed tears like everybody else. We hurt like everybody else. But see, the faith of the believer is not rooted in their emotions. The faith of the believer is rooted in the doctrine. Somebody shout the doctrine. See, it's the Christian doctrine that gets you through. See, it's what you believe. What do you know about the faith? Have you been to Sunday school? Do you come to 8 o'clock? Do you, do you attend the marriage ministry? Do you, uh, do you read your Bible? What do you know? Praise the Lord. Well, preacher, I, I'm not up on all, any of those things. Well, the day will come when you will wish to God that you were. See, the day when, when life hits. See, some folk can't, can't handle life, can't get over, can't move on, can't get any better. 40 years later, still grieving the same way because you don't know the doctrine. The doctrine gives us power. And by the way, by the way, you ought not to be the only one grieving. You ought not to be the only one crying. Can't get over it. Years later, you ought not to be the only one because if the deceased person was saved, they're not crying. They're not grieving. They are somewhere around the throne singing and shouting and nobody doubting. And they're trying to tell you, you better live your life. You better dry your eyes because I got it made up here, honey child, and I wouldn't come back if I could. You better know it. You better know it. You don't like that kind of talk? Paul told them, says, of the times and the seasons, I ain't got to even write to you. Say, because you perfectly know, chapter 5, that that day come like a thief in the night. I don't have time to deal with all of it, but then he gets to these standing orders in the section of uh, 1 Corinthians that's called uh, the final instructions. We find these orders. Final instructions start with verse 12. I won't read them because I can't read past them and not give commentary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'll just go to verse 16. He goes to the standing orders. And what I mean by standing orders, these are imperatives for the church throughout all ages. These are standing orders for, for the church. This is orthodoxy. It's true always. It is truth. It is God's truth that always has been, always is, and always will be. Every, this applies to every church. And this, this list is a, a powerful list. It is not exhaustive. It's not meant to be. But these things are very important. These imperatives, these orders are things that govern and rule the church. 
These are, as I mentioned, these are a must. Can I get a witness? First thing he says to us goes, goes a long way to our change. We we'll go a long way to our change in our church. Ah, and I hope it changes us individually. He says, rejoice always. Rejoice evermore. Rejoice always. Well, let me help you with this. The word, when he said rejoice always, rejoice always doesn't mean be happy all the time. Because the truth is, that is not possible. Nobody can be happy all the time. That is not possible. Amen. Praise the Lord. That's not possible. That is not possible. Praise the Lord. But the believer is to rejoice always. Feelings. Amen. Feeling happy is the natural response to a desired outcome or experiences that bring us reward. When we get what we want, it makes us happy. When an experience gives us a reward, it makes us happy. The word, the word hap means favorable circumstances. When the circumstances of life are favorable, we are, as well as we should be, happy campers. Ain't nothing wrong with being happy. I thank God that uh, my life is, has a lot of happiness in it. Praise the Lord. Uh, but it's, but that is, I'm not happy all the time. There are things in life that can rob you of your happiness. But my God, you can rejoice all the time. Because joy is not uh, based on happiness. Our joy, the basis of our joy is not desired outcome or experiences that bring us rewards. But joy is based on our relationship with Jesus. Can I get a witness? St. John 15 and verse 11, Jesus says, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. Can I get a witness? Chapter 16 and verse 20 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you uh, that you shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice, and you shall be sorrowful. See there? But your sorrow shall be turned into joy. He said, a woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow, uh, but her hour, because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered, of the child she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world and you know you now therefore have sorrow but I will see you again and your heart shall rejoice and your joy no man taketh from you when he said I will see you again he was saying when I get up from the grave Mm, you're going to see me and I'm going to give you joy that can't nobody take from you. Good God Almighty, you can give it up if you want to, but can't nobody take it from you. Hallelujah. And in that day, you shall ask me nothing. But verily, verily, I say unto you that whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you shall receive, that your joy may be full. Can I get a witness? In Jesus, we're able to distinguish between appearance and reality. Joy is not tied to the appearance of a thing. Joy is tied to the reality of a thing. I saw joy at work yesterday at Sister Sharon Figg's funeral. Mm, I looked at Mother Quentin, Mother Hinton, Mother Hinton and Brother Quentin and, and the family. Hallelujah. And when they got up and sang that song, when the family had to sing, yes, they, their feelings were hurt that their loved ones were dead. But, but they knew that there is an appearance and there is a reality. 
and uh, the appearance of the thing is uh, there is uh, a dead body there uh, but Quentin understood that his mother was not there because the reality is that his mother was not in that church she was not in that box she was not in that casket and she was not headed for the grave but that his mother was in the arms of Jesus and even though he will miss her physical presence the reality is that she's with the Lord y'all don't hear what I'm saying sometimes with tears meeting under your chin you're not happy but you still have joy good God on my have you ever gone through a tough time in your life hallelujah I saw you do it brother Julio lost your daughter baby died but you stood there like a preacher you said what needed to be said yes your feelings are hurt but I saw you when you cut a step the other day you still have joy do I have anybody in here who can say I'm not as happy at times as I would like to be because sometimes things happen that rob me of my happiness please don't make me think I ought to be happy when I slam my finger in the car door please don't try to make me think that I ought to be happy when my loved one dies please don't try to make me think that I ought to been happy when the doctor said he found cancer in my body but I want you to know that in the midst of all of that it dawned on me that God is still in charge that Jesus is still real and I couldn't even understand it except there is a peace that passeth all understanding when you know Jesus he gives you power to have joy even when happiness is gone you are still joyful because even though it appears that everything is falling apart you know that everything will be all right Christ gives us the right perspective Christ gives us when we see it through the eyes of Jesus you find out that no matter what's going on you still have a reason to rejoice rejoice is saying hallelujah with tears in your heart rejoicing is dancing when you'd rather be laying down crying rejoicing is smiling even when you're crying on the inside you still have a smile on your face rejoicing is knowing that through it all god's got my back through it all he's with me yeah yeah oh lord somebody say rejoice evermore we got to be a rejoicing church we got to be a rejoicing church y'all sing rejoicing music good god almighty keep your hands clapping keep your head shaking don't let the devil rob you of your joy i'm not saying that we can't slow it down sometime but i've been trying to tell you and every time i try to tell you i feel resistance from some who don't understand you may be a singer but you ain't the preacher good god almighty hallelujah i can't play an instrument but i understand spirits and i understand how they work and the devil want to come in and bring us music and bring us a sound that doesn't give us joy but i'd rather all you got to do is just go to the football game go to the basketball game go and see the troops before they go out to war go and listen to what they say we are soldiers in the army we have to fight although we have to cry we got to hold up the blood stained banner ah, hold it up till we die say yeah yeah oh lord 
somebody and say he knows something about fighting. You got, you got to get fired up. Sometimes in life, some of these folk who are around you, who try to hurt you, uh, who try to bring you down, I don't think they mean harm, but some of them just don't understand. I was so proud. It was, it was you, Quentin. And who else did they have to stand with you? Your aunt and uh, Mother Hinton. And who else? Another aunt. And right at the close of the service, no harm was meant, but uh, they were draped with a cloth and said, this is your mother's arms. It was designed to be a tearjerker. But I thank God that they have so much joy that they understood that that's a quilt. That's a blanket. That ain't my mama. My mama is somewhere. My sister is somewhere. My loved one is somewhere around the throne. And yes, I'll cry sometimes, but you ain't gonna make me cry. Yes, I'll cry sometimes, but I'm not gonna play your game because I have a joy. Yeah! On the inside! Yeah! Ah, yeah! Oh Lord! I see it with uh, the little chronic condition with your son. God Almighty! It would be so easy to get mad with God. It would be so easy to throw up your hands. And I imagine there have been times when you felt like doing that. But there is something on the inside that moves on the outside. There is a joy that the believer has. But you got to know Jesus. You got to be saved. You got to be connected to him. His joy will see you through even when happiness runs out. He says, so rejoice. Rejoice always. Rejoice evermore. And then I heard him say, pray. Come on, preacher, get through now. Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Now this, uh, this can't mean say prayers all the time. Well, that ain't possible. You got to get up and go to work. You got to eat. You got to live. You got to sleep. Hallelujah. Pray without ceasing is a phrase that establishes prayer as a major part of the Christian life. The truth is, we don't pray enough. We pray too seldom. Pray day and night. Pray. We need to pray in good times and bad. David said in Psalms 55 and 17, evening, morning, and at noonday, will I pray? Luke said, Jesus said in Luke uh, 18 and 1, men ought always to pray and not faint. To pray without ceasing is uh, one of the things is, uh, is uh, it's, it causes for a, a, a great amount of of discipline because the prayer life is not just a life of words coming out of your mouth but the prayer life is an inward life it's an attitude of prayer it's an inward thing let me help you one of the things that go on in all of us all the time you know something that happens in all of us all the time the thing is, we, th we think thoughts all the time. The human mind is always thinking. If they would put wires up to you, why are you up? Why are you sleeping? The brain waves will still be raving because you're, sti you're still thinking. They are conscious thoughts. They are unconscious thoughts. You're thinking all the time. You're thinking something when you think you're thinking nothing. We think all the time. Our thoughts are unceasing. You're thinking now. Thoughts control the movement 
of your hand. Thoughts control the movement of your head. Thoughts control the movement of your legs. Am I right about it? From our thoughts, we get most of our joy. And from our thoughts, we get most of our sorrows. It depends on your frame of mind. Thoughts are unceasing. Wouldn't it be something if the believer could begin to work on himself and begin to take his prayer life and put his prayer life on the same level as his thought life. So when your thoughts drift to something you shouldn't be thinking, stop right there and begin to pray. When your thoughts drift to lust, Stop right there and begin to pray. When your thoughts drift to fear, when your thoughts drift to envy, when your thoughts drift to jealousy, stop right there and begin to pray. Replace a lot of your thoughts with prayer. You don't have to move your mouth. God hears our prayers even when our lips are not moving. Some of us, we just let our thoughts run away. But if we pray, if when these things come to mind, you say, loose here, devil. I'm not going to lust after that woman. I'm not going to lust after that man. I'm not going to hate this individual. I'm not going to give up my joy. I'm going to pray against these thoughts. Satan, the Lord rebuke you because I want my mind and my heart to be clear. The Lord will. He'll clean up your heart. He'll clean up your mind. He'll clean up your thoughts. Your desires will change. Your appetite will change. Your lust will change. Your desire, the more of Jesus. You want Jesus and not adultery. You want Jesus and not fornication. You want Jesus and not jealousy because you learn how to replace that thought with prayer. Yeah! Yeah! Ah, yeah! Somebody give God praises. Uh, oh Lord and uh, let me give you the last one he said now pray without ceasing also everywhere every place every time that prayer is appropriate pray if it's appropriate then pray let me close here the last one which is probably the most popular in everything, give thanks. Oh, Lord, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. This is the third command or the third imperative. This one grows out of the first two. Joy and unceasing prayer, good God Almighty, causes a constant flow of gratitude. So many believers are ungrateful. There are believers today who will tell you to your face, I don't have anything to thank God for. The spirit of entitlement has replaced the spirit of gratitude. The Bible said in the last days, men would be unthankful. Ingratitude would be all in the land. But we got to learn to be thankful. Now the scripture didn't say, the scripture says, in everything, give thanks. <laughs> Hallelujah. It didn't say for everything, but it says in everything. There's a whole lot of things that happens to us that we're necessarily not thankful for. But I thank God that in the midst of it all, this imperative causes us to remember that no matter what goes on in our lives, God is at work. Hallelujah, 
how do we better understand this passage? Let us, let's move the emphasis of the passage from all things because that's not really what it's talking about. Let's move it from all things to the true subject of the passage. And the true subject is God. It's not the things, but it's God. It's God's constant superintendence. He's in charge. He rules and he super rules. When you realize that whatever is going on, that God allowed it, that God has a purpose behind it, that God's in it some kind of way, you quickly find reasons to give God thanks. When you realize that when you lost your loved one, it was the Lord saying, it's time to take them from labor to reward. When you realize when you lost that dream job, God understood that what looked like a dream job was actually going to turn into a nightmare. But he delivered you because he rules and super rules. When you realize that that thing in your life causing you so much aggravation that it was God helping you to improve, bringing out things in you that needed to be brought out helping you to see that there was still some bad words in your spirit, helping you to see that you still needed to grow. So he used the situation to bring you face to face with how wicked you were. When you understand that the Lord is in charge, good God Almighty, and that God is working everything together for your good, when you understand that he is the great superintendent of our lives, that he is in charge, whether it's raining, whether the sun is shining, whether the house is packed, whether the saints stayed home, whether you feel good or whether you feel bad, whether you're in season or out of season, when you realize that it was the Lord even when they sold Joseph into bondage, sold him to the Ishmaelites, Joseph said, you meant it for evil, but the Lord, he meant it for good. He's the superintendent. He's the one. He's in charge. Oh, yeah. When you realize that the Lord is in charge, you can't help but throw up your hands. You can't help but lift your voice. You can't help but praise the Lord. You can't help but give God thanks because we serve the God who said, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, thoughts of good, not of evil. I'm going to bring you to an expected end. Say it! Say it! Say it! Give him thanks. Give him thanks. Give him thanks. Give him thanks. Upper room, give him thanks. No matter where you are, no matter what's going on, give him thanks. Thank you. Let's be a Thanksgiving church. Let's be a Thanksgiving church. A Thanksgiving church. Woo! A Thanksgiving church. A church that's quick to praise. A church that's quick to give him glory. Quick to find the silver lining. Quick to find the hand of God. The blessings of the Lord in every situation. Hallelujah. Trusting that he knows what's best for me. Even when my weary eyes cannot see. He knows. He knows. He knows. And I trust him. And when you trust him, you can't help but lift your hands and say, Lord, 
I thank you. Thank you. Ah, thank you. I don't want to be the shallow athlete who only has a praise for the Lord or an acknowledgement to the Lord when he scores the touchdown. The only time God is good is when they win the game. Because I found out that God displays his goodness also in losses. Oh no. See, he's not just a God of addition. He's the God of subtraction. Oh, I don't believe that. He, he's the God of multiplication. So you got to decide who's going to be your pastor, me or Kenny Copeland. Jesus said, Every branch, every tree, everything that bath not fruit, he taketh away. But every tree that bringeth forth fruit, he purges it. To purge is to take away. It's to cut away. He purges it that it may bring forth more fruit. So he can't, it can't just be God when people are being added. It also has to be God when things are being subtracted. It can't just be God when you get hired. It's also God when you get a pink slip. Because the law, the believer has the perspective that the Lord is in charge. What is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you? That I give thanks in rejoicing, that I give thanks in praying, that I give thanks in every situation in life, that the believer learn to be thankful. Now, when we put these three in place, whoo, what kind of church? What kind of church? Oh, the heaviness goes away. Hallelujah. Attitudes change. Uh, people become more attractive. Some of you would be much prettier if you just had joy. You, 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 you get a spouse if you just show joy. You, you, they, he he think you're pretty, but he's scared to say something to you because you look too mean. Don't never see you get happy. She, she would like to go out with you, but you're so tense and so straight-laced. You, 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 you repel people. Maybe, maybe you need glasses because you're always squinting, and the squint looks like a frog. I'm serious. I'm teaching you something. I'm teaching you something. I want to know why everybody's looking past me. They're looking past you because when they look at you, they never see joy. You have white teeth when you will show them. Got a wonderful personality if you let it shine through. But if, but if people don't see it, if it's not apparent, you don't hear me. It, it, it creates an aura. It, it puts a veneer uh, that may, that, and you may not be like that at all. At all. You may be the nicest person in the world, but you didn't, you didn't let the rest of you know. So therefore, see, therefore, oh, I'm preaching. We've been, we've been to churches where we knew the people were saved, know the pastor's saved and all that, but the, but the folk are just mean. Smile at them, they won't smile back. You wave at them, they won't half wave. And, and some of them are nice people, but they have no joy. They don't display gratitude. See, one thing about it, 
If anybody ever have to ask you, did you appreciate what they did for you? That means you failed. Gratitude is always known. They bless you and they have to ask you, what, well, do you like it? Is, is, is it all right? It, you know. well, yeah, I love it. Uh-uh. Right. Uh-uh. Because gratitude can't be healed. That's right. Gratitude. Gratitude. You can see gratitude. Hallelujah. Just like you can see disappointment. That's exactly right. God is looking. And the world is looking. What I liked that I saw on the faces of the young folk at the temple when I got saved, they didn't look like what I'd come from. They, they, they were different from what I saw on my side of town. They didn't have any more than we had. I mean, you know, all black folk, you know, you know, all the poor. But that was a joy. That was smile. There were laughter. Amen. There were things that I found attractive. Man, this brother got something I don't have. It ain't his shoes. I mean, don't neither one have them, you know, nice shoes. They ain't, they, ain't, they ain't shoes. I can tell you, he, he shop at the same place I shop at. Both of got on the same cheap pants. They ain't the clothes. But there's a look in his eyes. There's a sparkle. And when I look in the mirror and I look at people, we don't have that. It's that joy. 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 Somebody who wants God to work these orders in their lives. These three imperatives. Meet me at the altar. Meet me at the altar. Lord, I want these imperatives at work in me. I want to pray more. Pray without ceasing. I want my prayer life, my thought life, and my prayer life to work together. I want to learn how to catch my mind when it drifts and fight the drift with prayer. Hallelujah. Instead of coming unglued, Lord, and fainting, I want to become a prayer warrior. Men ought always to pray. Pray, prayer is the antidote to fainting. To faint means to lose heart. Well, I'm not as fired up as I, as I used to be. It means you lost heart. The believer should never lose heart. And when you feel that you're losing heart, get on your knees and stay there until God makes a difference. Joy. Joy. Lord. Father, we come before you right now in the name of Jesus. 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 We come. Oh God. We want our church to continue. We want to continue as believers. We want, oh God, to be strong. We want to be impactful. We want to grow in grace and in your knowledge. We don't want to outgrow biblical Christianity. We want to walk in the doctrine. We want to walk in Christian purity. We want our minds change. We come to the altar to challenge desires, cravings, thoughts that are contrary to holiness and sound doctrine. We come before you right now, Lord. We come before you right now, Lord. We come before you. Oh, God, we lift our hearts and we lift our hands and we ask you, oh Lord, to work these orders, these standing orders in us oh god teach me to rejoice 
teach me to be a rejoicing believer. Hallelujah. Paul understood in, in Thessalonica to keep the pagans at bay. The saints needed to have joy. Nothing repels the devil like joy. In the name of Jesus, good God Almighty, we don't look over at the world and envy them, for we have something that they don't have. We have joy. Hallelujah, Jesus. We have a weapon that is the most powerful one in all of Scripture, the weapon of prayer. We can call on you in the name of Jesus. Ah, and then God give us to display the attitude the attitude that you want us to display. And that is the attitude of gratitude. And Lord, I heard my pastor say that our gratitude affects our altitude in Christ. Lord, let me be grateful. I'm grateful. I'm just grateful for what you've done. I'm grateful for the great things that you've already done. I, I appreciate the great things. And even the small things are great things. We're just thankful. Lord, let the spirit of thankfulness just, I'm thankful. I'm thankful. We're thankful. We're thankful. We're thankful. We thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. When it's raining, thank you. When it's snowing, thank you. Thank you. When we're happy, thank you. When we're not, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. When we understand, thank you. When we don't, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. When we're getting what is due us, thank you. And when we're being overlooked, thank you. Hey, hey God, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you. And not only are we thankful to you, Lord, but give us to be thankful to each other. To be appreciative in the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Give God praises today. Hallelujah. Standing orders. Standing orders. Standing orders. These aren't options. These are things that the Lord has commanded that all of us do and display. Now let's work on it. In Jesus' name. You can go back to your seats. Praising the Lord. Thank you. 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 Thank you.